Hi, welcome to the World Financial Symposium's Market Spotlight webcast series. Today's focus is on M&A for cybersecurity companies. I'm Justin Ron with WFS, an international organization dedicated to educating technology leaders through webcasts like these and live conferences. Learn more about us at www.wfs.com. I would like to now introduce today's moderator, John Scott, Senior Vice President of the Quorum Group. I'm John Scott, and I'll be hosting the conference. As Justine mentioned, I'm with the Quorum Group, and we're the platinum sponsors of the Spotlight Series. Quorum is a leading advisor in software and tech M&A, and I'm particularly interested in security, having been the CEO of a security and compliance software company in the past. Um, and and what I, I'm just going to give you some opening thoughts, but in a world of, of huge amounts of free-flowing data, the, the use of mobile devices and web access, the need for security technology is just more keenly felt than ever. And then in turn, this is driving high valuations and significant deal flow for innovative security technology firms. And the market spotlight today is going to examine some specific technologies receiving a lot of interest with perspective from analysts, bankers, and CEOs. Nobody seems to be safe with respect to security breaches. In addition to large retailers, media companies, and financial institutions, technology companies like eBay and Snapchat have been hacked, and government organizations and healthcare institutions are also big targets. But beyond the damage of the breach itself is often the way the breach is discovered or announced, and that can create tough reputation and brand damage. In the latest big government breach at the Office of Personnel and Management, officials in the Obama administration announced that millions of sensitive records associated with current and past federal employees have been exposed by a long-running infiltration of their networks and systems. A long-running breach like this is called an advanced persistent threat. And the government claimed that the breach had been found during an effort to correct problems with OPM security and it had, quote, undertaken aggressive uh, efforts to update its cybersecurity posture, end quote. But those statements were not accurate. Uh, according to the Wall Street Journal report, the breach was discovered during a sales demonstration of a network forensic software package. So imagine this, you're having a demo with the OPM, and they ran a diagnostic study on the network, and during this demonstration discovered software malware was embedded all over the network. So according to federal investigators, that malware had been placed for, in place for over a year, and U.S. intelligence agencies joined the investigation into the breach, but it's still not clear what data was really accessed by the attackers. And breaches like this are what make uh, CISOs or chief information security officers wonder every day how safe their organization is. Now, publicized events are just a fraction of the overall exposure to losses from these cyber incidents. And in 15, 2015, estimates are, are these, these damages are going to be in hundreds of billions of dollars. As a result, many firms have dramatically increased their cybersecurity budgets. And these uh, budgets are rising continuously. And it's really interesting to see how quickly a sale of a security product can happen once a company has suffered a breach. All of a sudden, budget's available, and all of a sudden, the selling, uh, selling cycle is reduced, reduced to sometimes days. And it's interesting, I meet with hundreds of CEOs and software tech companies every year, and the question I'm asked the most is where I think the biggest opportunities are. And my answer is pretty simple. The opportunities are in security. In fact, if you have a chance, get a copy of Quorum's 2015 World Tech M&A report and look at the section titled Top 10 Disruptive Technology Trends, and the thing you'll see is that security overarchs all of these trends. Now, the agenda today will include an overview of M&A in the security sector by quorum analyst Aaron King, followed by a review of key market trends that I think are leading the sector. And then there'll be, an, you know, and essentially where the next wave of M&A activity will come from. And then we'll have a Q&A session with a founder of Stop the Hacker, a web security company that was recently acquired. So, Aaron, let me turn it over to you. Thanks, John. Valuations in the overall infrastructure market have dipped a little bit since late last year, but EBITDA multiples remain steady near 14 times overall, with this May doing slightly better than last. 
Sales valuations are up from 3.5 to 4 times, not quite up to last year's high of 4.7, but showing a definite increasing trend. Here in the security market, EBITDA multiples have increased from 14 times to an average of about 16 times over the past year, while sales multiples have slowly climbed from 5.5 to 7 times. Notice that the slowing of the overall infrastructure market has had relatively little effect on the security market, which continues to show valuations well above average for the sector. After a heavy dip in early 2013, both deal count and disclosed deal values are once again on the rise. The low deal count and disclosed value at the end of 2014 reflects the peak in valuations at that time. Deal count this high indicates a lot of small to medium purchases. Good news for companies like Corum Client Beware, which was sold to French application security provider Denial in mid-2014. Turning now to top total spenders in the security sector, we have four billion-plus spenders in the past three years. Cisco leads the pack, with four acquisitions totaling just under $3 billion, including their $2.7 billion acquisition of intrusion detection SaaS company Sourcefire, strengthening their own network security and leveraging their existing market penetration to give Sourcefire a wider footprint. In the market's most recent mega deal, Raytheon spends $1.3 billion to form a joint venture with Vista Equity Partners portfolio company WebSense. The new company will combine WebSense's integrated security platform with Raytheon's software products to protect commercial and government entities globally. Our top contributor to total deal count is Proofpoint, a security-as-a-service threat protection suite snagging five anti-malware companies since 2012 for a total of about $100 million. Plenty of other acquirers hovered in the three to four range. Enterprise cybersecurity provider Blue Coat is of particular interest, acquiring three companies in a short time before being snapped up itself by Bain Capital for $2.4 billion in the fourth largest deal the industry has ever seen. Bain is considering returning Blue Coat to the public market now that it has had time to grow. Here we have relative growth and security details separated out by segment. Deal count is up significantly across all the sectors, with new technology and penetration testing beginning to take off in earnest. Deal numbers increased 400% between 2013 and 2014. Synopsys has been particularly active in this field, enhancing its Coverity platform with two penetration testing ads in the past quarter alone, first Codonomicon in April, and then assets from Quotium in May. Growth is up significantly in other sectors overall, and even premises network security, which had a drop in deals during 2014, is bouncing back with more deals already this year than it had last year in total, including Splunk, who acquired anomaly detection cybersecurity provider Metaphor just a few days ago in the hopes of further evolving their M2M system. And F-Secure, who shelled out $16 million plus earnout for Danish vulnerability assessment provider NSense to expand their incident response and forensic expertise. Geographical market shares have remained fairly consistent over the last few years, with Africa and the Middle East gaining a notable slice of the pie recently, particularly in Israel, which has seen a surge of activity most recently with CA Technologies' acquisition of IDM Logic just this month. The $25 million buy is a clear strengthening of CA's identity and access management offerings. Also recently in Israel, eBay spent $60 million for predictive anti-malware developer Cyactive through their subsidiary PayPal, hoping to head off in advance any threats to PayPal's existing security platform. Notice also that Latin America has slowly begun to emerge into the security market, with ZeroFox acquiring Chile's stealth mode security company, Volner, earlier, earlier this year. ZeroFox will be incorporating Volner's technologies and practices moving forward, hoping to strengthen its position as the social risk management company. Meanwhile, back here in Seattle, White Pages just picked up anti-phishing mobile app NumberCop to enhance its caller ID services. Back to you, John. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. I, I think the Bain acquisition of Blue Coat tells a really interesting story uh, many of you may know that Blue Coat was a public company and really undervalued when they were taken private by uh, equi private equity firm Toma Bravo. Uh, Aaron, when was that? They bought them in December of 2011, and they paid $1.3 billion, or 2.2 times revenues. Yeah, now, you mentioned they did some acquisitions. They did, but not at first. They initially worked on improving their operations, but they did three in 2013, including Solara Networks. Yeah, so this is interesting. So a four-year holding period, 
by a private equity uh, firm, three acquisitions, and then they sell to Bain for $2.4 billion. That's a 3.7 times revenue multiple, isn't it? That's right. And as I mentioned, Bain has said that they're considering taking Blue Coat back out into the public markets. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a, a really interesting story, a nice story uh, for the private equity folks. Well, I want to I change gears here, and I want to comment on a few areas of cybersecurity that I think are getting a lot of visibility. The first is cloud security. The problem with cloud is that the corporate IT guys tend to pass on the security responsibility to their cloud vendor and not take seriously their role as the overall gatekeeper. In best practices, this is a shared responsibility. Now, many of the SaaS vendors' applications in particular don't have security as a top priority. It's just not high enough on their list, and they often don't have the expertise, which leads to a real lack of control and compliance. Now, a number of new, well-funded startups are providing deeper visibility into cloud usage, threat analysis, and active enforcement of cloud application security policies. There are so many great cloud applications out there, and CIOs and, and chief information security officers are al allocating much more of their budget this year to security. Now, the next area is automated incident response. It's just not good enough to detect a problem and report on it. The CIO must also be prepared to move at great speed when breaches occur. With automation, these alerts are prioritized and responded to instantly when a dangerous or an anomalous situation arises. Enterprises have a limited staffing, and they face huge liabilities for failing to respond to detected, detected threats like this. Expect to see CIOs uh, adopt incident response solutions significantly in the next 18 months. Now, a few minutes ago, I mentioned the huge breach at the U.S.'s uh, Office of Personnel Management that was reported last month. And as I mentioned, this is what the industry calls an advanced persistent threat. This is like a well-planned bank robbery where the thieves case the bank and deliveries of cash for months before they execute on the robbery. Now, these attacks are a stealthy, uh, really, uh, they're stealthy, and they attack a specific company and penetrate their networks over months or sometimes even a year, and then they wait for the ideal time to make their move. Malicious code gets installed typically in multiple hosts in the enterprise to perform specific tasks while remaining undetected. If they do get detected, the hackers simply move on to the next less protected enterprise. These attacks can be financially driven or Sometimes it's one corporation trying to steal trade secrets from another. Sometimes it's government sponsored. Now, the other trend we're, we're beginning to see is consortiums of security providers developing alliances where they'll share the threat information they've gathered. Surprisingly, this type of cooperation has not happened much in the past. It's been like a bunch of small police departments that just aren't talking. They don't share information about the bad guys, so it makes it much harder to catch them. Symantec, McAfee, and Palo Alto Networks founded an organization called the Cyber Threat Alliance, and so expect to see more of this type of collaboration. And then, as Aaron pointed out, mergers and acquisitions are on the rise in security. An awful lot of cybersecurity innovation is carried out by small startups with very focused teams. These small companies become huge subject matter experts in their particular specialty, and then they begin to develop some initial customer traction. They begin to get on the radar of larger vendors who are always looking to acquire products and complement their existing offerings. And, and the large vendors know that a, an enterprise customer would rather buy a comprehensive solution from one company than a bunch of small point solutions. In many cases, it just doesn't simply pay for the large vendor to try to spec and hire the talent and take over, uh, you know, over a one- or two-year time to develop new features when they can simply go out and buy it. We see this especially in the security area. Now, I had a chance to uh, speak with Anurban Banjari, the founder of Stop the Hacker, a company focused on website malware monitoring and artificial intelligence-based remediation software for website operators. He founded the company in 2008 and sold it last year to San Francisco-based Cloudflare. He founded the company after he received his Ph.D. from the University of California in computer science. And it's interesting, he focused, he focused that doctorate on permission technology and also studying network traffic. So let's, uh, let's go ahead, Nurban. 
Thanks very much, Anurban, for joining us today. Why don't you just uh, tell us quickly, what's your background? I know you have a PhD in computer science, and I also noticed on your uh, LinkedIn page you have a picture of you standing next to Steve Wozniak. I thought that was an interesting. <laughs> but, but tell me about your background and how you, how you started, uh, started Stop a Hacker. Yes, absolutely. Um, my background is primarily in information technology. I did my undergrad in India, uh, finished in 2004, and came over to the U.S. Uh, same year to do the PhD in computer science at the University of California at Riverside. My work was primarily in network traffic classification, identification, uh, things like that. Um, during the process of that PhD for the next four years, from 2004 to 2008, uh, we were also scraping websites to get information about where our data streams coming from, like podcasts, which websites are publishing podcasts, which websites have BitTorrent files on them. You know, to understand how network traffic goes from these websites to clients, can we profile that or not? In doing so, what we also found is these websites were also spreading malware, and they were getting hacked left and right. Google had, at that point of time, started to uh, blacklist websites, and people were uh, we're posting on the internet, we don't really understand what's really going on. How can we recover from the situation? Uh, we decided to look into the issue and we found that to be really interesting how hackers were breaking in, what type of malware was on the website. And we started offering help for free with my PhD advisor, Dr. Mihaly Salutsos. Uh, we started a company in 2008 called, uh, yeah, in 2009, January, called Stop the Hacker. And we ran that company for about four and a half years, and it got acquired by Cloudflare, which is in San Francisco. Um, and uh, we are still offering web malware security to identify malware on websites and tell the website owner, uh, here's a piece of malware on the website. If you click a button, it will automatically remove it for you. It's kind of like antivirus, not for websites and website owners. That's what we build. Um, and a uh, year and a half ago, I left to start my, a couple of months ago, I left to start my new company, Onion ID, which does identity and access management. Uh, the next generation of identity and access management, that's what we're building up. Um, that's where we are. That's my background, primarily of security, network classification. Yeah, interesting. So, so given, I mean, the, the number of data breaches just in the last couple of days has been incredible. When you look at security, I mean, it's a broad segment. And especially this Office of Personnel Management, I mean, the, the breach, I, I just read today that like 18 million social security numbers were hacked. If you look at these continuing data breaches, what do you think the biggest concerns that chief information security officers are having? You're sitting out there and you're a CISO of a major fortune company. I mean, what's scaring you, especially you've got a background in permission technology and studying traffic? I think one of the biggest issues that she's worried about at this time is identity and access management, primarily because if you look at where we are in terms of security in companies, identity and access management is akin to an M&M, &M, like a piece of candy. It's hard on the outside and soft on the inside. Once you get access inside the organization, more or less you can do whatever you like. And there's very few privilege management going on. Not that because companies don't want to do it, but because it's cumbersome, it's hard, it's hardware-based. If there's lots of APIs that you need to integrate, it's a complete thing in order to do this kind of access management for employees and whatnot. And if you take a look at all these other uh, incidents of data breaches that have happened over the last two years, really, not even just the last month, these have all stemmed from stolen credentials. And we know that username and passwords are bad. We have implemented single sign-on. We have implemented two-factor authentication, but still things don't work. And the primary reason things don't work over there is there is so much user friction in terms of security products that employees and people try to find ways around the system in order to get access to the resources that they want access to. And as a security community, I, it, it hurts me to say that we are not taking that into consideration. We are building products that we say are, oh, this is better than what was there before. This is smoother than what was there before. This is more secure than the, what was there before. But we are, we are not paying enough attention to the user experience, trying to understand how much pain is being put on the actual employee or the end user when they use security products. We are not trying to make Apple pay for security. 
And that's a question that I don't think the community we need to understand and answer. Yeah, I, I think that's a that's a, a great point because so many uh, the issue that we see and I know Quorum's analysts talk about is you're basically trying to make it easier to use products. Uh, and, and the problem that you have is if you're making products easier to use and easier to access, what tends to happen is security breaches can go up. And what you're saying is if the products are if the security products are difficult to use, people try to work around them, and that just creates even more uh, even more risks. Exactly. And the only thing that the way that the access control for servers is maintained in organization. As, as, as a typical example, people when they try to SSH into a server, they will use SSH keys. There's very few products out there that will let you manage these SSH keys in a holistic fashion in an easy way. They're all cumbersome. The developers need to change a bunch of stuff on their side. The DevOps team needs to change a bunch of stuff on the other side when they deploy servers. This doesn't make sense because it actually increases the workload on every single person in the organization. And that's not how the security product should work. It should work in a transparent, invisible manner where the workload is actually reduced so people feel happy using the product. People don't try to find ways around the product. There's so many organizations that I've talked to where they've implemented stuff, and 70% of security purchases are just put on the shelf. Yeah, the, the shelfware concept. One of the things I know that in security especially, that a lot of the innovation is coming from relatively small teams in, in small startups. And then the big guys, the big companies basically are looking and saying, well, gosh, if I go to try to develop this, uh, this particular product we're seeing on the market, you know, but from a startup, it's going to take me two years or three years to get, to get, build a team, get it developed, and, and get out in the market. I mean, do you see a lot of innovation coming from the small companies that are actually then, then in, in the long run, they're being, being acquired? I definitely see a lot of innovation coming from the smaller companies, primarily because when you look at the mix of any uh, co-founders or technical team in a startup, uh, ours is a prime example where everybody in our team has burnt their fingers on IAM, Island Engineer Access Management. We've been frustrated with moving all two factor authentication. We've been frustrated with doing something about passwords in our organizations. And every startup, they get together this four or five group of people who are very passionate about the product. They stay up for 16 hour days if the need be. They need top runner if the need be. They stay up at the desk if the need be. We are, we, we're not just doing this to earn money. We really want to do something that changes the landscape in terms of what we believe in. And so, therefore, we can take bigger risks. For a large company to say, hey, we're going to just throw away all of our entire code base, and we're going to start from scratch, and we're going to do this and do that. Of course, there's cross between the more that in bigger company. For a startup, it's much more easy to say something like that. Hey, we're going to try this thing for the next one year. We're going to give up all our jobs. We're going to jump in all the way and do this. Therefore, we are more nimble. We can try to build the entire, uh, we can run the entire gamut and go the entire way and say, we're just going to write things from scratch. We're going to do open source software, this, that, whatever. We can take more risks for sure. I suppose that risk profile in the fact that you also don't have a legacy, a legacy base of either code or products that you have to go back to. So that's an interesting element. So here you you started Stop the Hacker, you built it up, you sold it, and now you're starting getting an access management company, and probably the same trend will happen as you build and then you fit in. But if there were two or three things that you could tell, because we have a number of, of CEOs of, of companies actually from around the world listening today, what would you say are the three or four things that a startup and security from an attribute standpoint that's important to you, especially since you've been through this before? I think uh, when, when you make a choice in terms of whether we should use a product or not, or even understand the need to use a product. Um, you should really try to understand what are you trying to accomplish from this thing. Uh, most people use identity and access management to either secure the infrastructure, make it easier for their employees not to remember passwords, all that stuff, do compliance requirements. So it's important to understand why are you doing this. If you don't understand what you're doing, you just buy a product, it will not work, people will complain, and it will be a bad investment. So it's important as a first to understand why you're doing this. 
once you understood why you're doing this, you need to also understand the startup or the small company that you are engaging with. Do they really understand what they're doing? For example, there's a bunch of products out there which were built as consumer products, as in my field, let's say, password managers, and now they are being dressed up to say, oh, businesses can use them. That's not the right way to do things because if you don't have the product built from the bottom up, built for businesses with security in mind, that's a bit completely, that's a completely different way of thinking of security versus, hey, let's do something really quick and want it to my mother and my father and they're happy with it and now we'll go to companies because their bones are still old. The product architecture doesn't scale. It was not built to take away from the get go. It was just built to do something really small, uh, target a completely different market. So it's important to also understand who is in the market who can actually help me and can align with my security goals. Uh, these are two things that I really feel that are important. Another thing that I've seen in teams is when the POC or something of that sort happen, it's important to also have good conversation. It shouldn't be that, hey, we have a POC document. Anybody who wants can just apply for this thing and just show us what you have and then we're good enough. You should really sit down with them and talk with them as to can you give our needs, can you actually deliver on the needs or not? And there's so many companies who will say, don't worry about it. We'll get you this product or this feature in the next 30 days and 60 days. Put it in the contract. Don't just accept a POC thing by somebody saying it will be there in 60 days, put it in the contract. So a lot of people don't do that, and I think that's important. It also makes the company who's trying to service your needs put their money where their mouth is. Yeah, those are some, some really good points. I think really understanding why you're doing what you're doing is important, and I think your other your other point is is starting out you know, from the bottom up that you're going to be built for business that this is not just something that was thrown together and doesn't have a strong architecture underneath it. Finally, so you've gone through a build process and an acquisition process. Any, say, one or two key points that you'd, you'd say, boy, uh, you know, if I were sitting down with a friend that I went through my Ph.D. program with and they, they were going to start a company, what one or two things would you tell them about the M&A side of it? I think the M&A side of it is really exciting. Um, where if you find the right partner, it can go really, really well. Uh, what I would say is, is uh, it's more important when we start a company to think about that how are we going to develop a scalable business versus my exit is three years from now and probably an antivirus company is going to acquire me. If that's going to happen, it's going to happen. You're going to talk to your board, to your company, to everybody, and understand if that's a good deal or not for everybody. But that shouldn't be why you start the company or what you start thinking about. But an MMA process can be really exciting and can be really uh, fruitful when you find the right team who is willing to work with you and improve the product launch the product even after that revision. Most of the companies that acquire com uh, smaller startups the product gets killed after six, six months down the line. The customers who are using the product, they get shunted and like, hey, you know what, uh, good luck, we're closing the product down and all that stuff. I would recommend that if you really value your customers, have a conversation up front with the acquirer, let them know what your expectations are, understand what their expectations are in terms of using the product, why are they acquiring you, that's important. Because otherwise that leads to misalignment and that can be very painful afterwards. Yeah, well, never mind. that's an excellent point. Alignment is a, is a critical element with M&A, and we see that at, at Quorum every day. Well, listen, I really appreciate you joining us. So Nirvan Energy, and he was the founder of Stop the Hacker, and he's on to a new identity and access management company. Appreciate you, uh, you talking with us this morning. Thank you. Yeah, I want to begin to wrap up uh, this and get to just a couple of brief uh, brief questions. It's interesting to see what an urban has gone from website malware monitoring all the way to, over to this uh, uh, this access and identity management. Both of those are really, really of high interest to uh, acquirers. He also talked about a number of attributes that startup companies um, uh, have, and, and what we've done is we've established a number of traits we think create the basis of a, of a successful security company in an acquisition area. And let me just go through them briefly. Number one, chasing the real, a real vulnerability. Really make sure that this is a trend that, that companies are going to be faced with. Don't try to be solving small problems. Secondly, develop it with an expandable architecture. In other words, it's, it's not something that you want to build for today, you want to build it for today and for tomorrow. 
Uh, number three, the subject matter expertise and passion of the team is really critical, and, and that's, what, that's what's driving these acquisitions. You've got 15 people, 10 people that have huge knowledge, uh, knowledge base in certain areas. And then customer references. You've got to go out and get some referenceable customers. Otherwise, uh, otherwise the, the concept is just not going to be widely accepted by an acquirer. And then finally, begin with the end in mind. Who might possibly be a buyer for you? What security company out there has gaps that you're filling? That's a good way to look at it. And uh, I'll wrap up here. We've got just a minute or so for questions. I'm just going to pick two. One was uh, from uh, Raphael. He asked in the big government breach, uh, was the vendor doing the demo ever identified? And that's a great question. We did a little bit of digging here. And it was a small company, and I think it was out of Virginia, called SciTech Services. And they put out a press release about 10 days ago, and their product is called Cypher Enterprises. And I think the company was founded by an ex-Army Special Forces guy. So that's a fascinating story. Um, second question from Bob in, in – that was why was a company like Blue Coat so undervalued when they were public? Public company shareholders often have a very short outlook and force companies to focus on near-term results. And if they don't see these results, the stock prices can fall. And Toma Bravo is a very smart buyer. They acquired the company, and they took it private, and they weren't subject to publicizing their quarterly results. And so essentially they were able to focus on the longer-term view and double the company's value in that four-year period. So, uh, again, a, a great story. And uh, I, that's, I'm going to go ahead and just cut it off right there. We're right at the uh, bottom of the hour, 30 minutes. We appreciate you attending today. If you've got questions that didn't get answered, my email address is down below, J-O-N-S at quorumgroup.com. I'd be happy to get back to you that way. And thanks again for joining us, and WFS, thanks for uh, putting the conference on. We appreciate it.